Shall we begin? Let me rephrase it this way. There are three things standing between you and food and wine at my house. This session, Devin's concluding brilliance, and then sort of concluding administrative instructions, including uh, the arrangement of rides will, that will be done by Ryan Higgins. So let's, <laughs> let's begin our session. So we now come to the labor law session. I love the... I love the labor law session. It reminds us of the power of the boss. So my boss got us started this morning, Kate Bartlett, and she framed the discussion in a variety of ways. First of all, I knew at this conference that the man in the dress would show up. He always does. <laughs> I didn't bet that it would be Me Too. Kate made it Me Too, it turns out. And we could talk about that, but I won't. Um, at least not until I've had a glass of wine. Um, she also said, oh, well, we're going to do the collective rights stuff at the end. So here we are, finally, at the end. And so I wanted to start our session by asking sort of what power does labor law, or specifically the law of collective rights, give us in thinking about this? And I have three ideas that I'm going to throw out there, and then we're going to... Um, I'm going to introduce our panelists and we're going to hear from them. First of all, it seems to me that labor law is the realm of law that challenges the idea that in a way has been left somewhat untouched today, that the customer comfort zone is, as Barbara Flagg called it, the new, new property. The right of the customers at Whole Foods not to be confronted with somebody who's wearing a product that was tested on animals or somebody wearing leather. I find that absolutely wrong. I just don't think customers have that right, and I think labor law gives us the power to see why. Secondly, labor law, as Marion and Diane and Michael are going to tell us, it challenges the power of the company to brand its employees, brand literally, physically. Um, and thirdly, it challenges the idea that the employer has total control of the employee's body, over the employee's psyche while at work, leaving, as Michael Selmy said this morning, only the employee's private life, whatever that might be, for employee control. I think I've misstated his argument provocatively and deliberately. So to do those things, perhaps, or whatever else it is that they want, since after all I believe in employee power, we have Diane Avery, who is a Duke alumna and a professor at SUNY Buffalo. We have Marion Crane, who is a pro law professor, but also the the effective director, the, the, the real director, not the titular director of the <laughs> uh, University of North Carolina Center on uh, Poverty, Law, and work Opportunity. And opportunity. Yes, work, 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 <laughs> <laughs> and opportunity. And Michael Yanowski, who, while he's here, has presumably a welcome respite from his job as Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at Roger Williams Law School. Thank you all. And we have their picture. OK. Um, I am going to start, and Diane and I are going to share this time together to tell you the story uh, that we obviously went on about at far too much length in the paper. Um, we wanted to first show you the new face of capitalism. Um, this is Carrie Smith. She is the woman that we discuss in the opening introduction of our paper who got $15,000 on eBay who auctioned off her forehead for a permanent brand by Golden, from, uh, to GoldenPalaceCasino.com for $15,000. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, we'll see another person who managed to get paid for being branded. This is a woman who was paid a lesser amount to have her cleavage permanently branded. That's enough of the brands. <laughs> okay. uh, now, why we, we searched around and ended up using these images, not only to show you what the new face of capitalism might look like, but also to, to sort of bring to a head one of the points we want to make here, which is whatever we think about the contract that Carrie Smith made, uh, whether we think she didn't get enough money, whether we think that it's immoral or unethical for a corporation to purchase a body part in this way, 
she did get paid for the exact thing she sold, which was her face. And our position in this paper essentially is that the workers, Darlene Jesperson being one example uh, that we're concerned with, low-waged women service workers, often do not get paid for the parts of their bodies that they effectively sell, that is, for leasing the employer their bodies as a locus for the employer's brand. Um, obviously, they're paid for their labor. We're saying that they are selling, in effect, something above and beyond that that they're not receiving compensation for. So the first question we're asking is, should service workers required to conform to appearance codes by service businesses that brand their workers as part of a larger marketing strategy that's designed, uh, as we heard from Harris Council today, to promote a distinctive corporate identity for purposes of garnering greater profits, should those workers receive compensation for selling their, those parts of their bodies? That is something that traditionally we would look to either contract law on an individual basis, that is um, individual employees contracting with their employers to sell pieces of their bodies, or labor law, uh, unions negotiating collectively on, be on behalf of workers collectively with employers to sell uh, or to receive compensation for that. The second question we're asking is, is branding of this sort that is sexualized or potentially, we haven't had a chance to think all the way through this, racialized, ethnicized, uh, religious branding, any sort of branding that offends one of the prohibitions on discrimination under Title VII, the kind of practice that should be barred altogether, regardless of the amount of compensation, because it encodes sexual stereotypes, or in this case, sexual stereotypes. Um, let me say a few words about branding at this point. We've been talking about it all day, and I'm not confident that everyone's had a chance to read this um, long tome that we wrote. So let me say just a few things about branding that we consider critical that, that sort of define what we're talking about. Um, essentially, we think of branding as the process of using market surveys directed at consumers to find out what consumers' tastes are, uh, and then designing or developing a brand that draws customers to the business, and specifically is designed to build brand loyalty and passion in consumers for the brand. Advertising is a critical part of this to market the particular brand to the consumer so that in the consumer's mind, the business and the brand become one. Now, most people can understand this pretty easily in the context of product branding. But in the context of service branding, it's a bit different. This is what struck us as newer and more interesting about this analysis. Um, here, the customer preference is especially critical because customers participate in creation of the brand. The service, in effect, involves the customer and is the branding process. It's interactive. And that's, because of that, the employer must regulate aspects of the employee's identities, including not only personal appearance, but also behavior, which is uniforms, grooming codes, facial expressions. And we, we talk about a case here called the Safeway Smile case, where Safeway mandated smiling and eye contact on behalf of all of its employees with customers as part of a, a branding strategy to in, improve its uh, service and to buy customer loyalty. There are no clear boundaries between workers, the work process, and the product being sold in this kind of a of a triad. Uh, and so it obviously has much more potential to encroach upon employee autonomy, if you will. We describe in this paper how it operates at, at essentially two levels, the first at the hiring level and the second at the training and inculcation of brand values level. We talked some this morning in one of the other panels about the, the hiring level. That's the question of hiring for brand fit and the Abercrombie and Fitch example of discriminatory brand fit hiring. Beyond that, of course, there are many more subtle ways to hire for brand fit that may not violate Title VII. Um, none nonetheless, they are part of the process. And the second aspect is training employees once they're in place and promulgating work rules that are designed to inculcate brand values. And I just want to read you our description of this taken from a couple of prominent um, texts in the area describing branding as a process. Maximally effective branding is not scripted. 
A scripted encounter is unlikely to be perceived as authentic, and the emotional connection that the business is seeking to make between customer and, and business is not made. Accordingly, employers might institute training programs that seek to transform workers' personalities as well as appearances and thought processes so that they make predictable judgments that the employer would approve, even in variable work scenarios where, they, where the res responses may not be predictable. Essentially, what they're looking to produce then through this branding process is, quote, the brand in action, branding from the inside out. Ideally, says one tome, training programs and policies should produce a staff that acts, looks, sounds, and even feels in sync with the brand. And we give a couple of examples from industry, not necessarily gendered, one involving Disney and the other involving Amway of relatively sophisticated branding strategies that essentially do this. Now, uh, the law, as I think you'll hear from others, both Diane and Michael, reinforces the employer's right to do this as a property right. And it does that in every legal context to one degree or another. In one of my favorite cases that we mention in here, in a union insignia case where an employee was disciplined for wearing a union button at work in a hotel context, very recent NLRB case, the board said, uh, or the employer argued, this, this union button is like graffiti on the Mona Lisa. We've created the tapestry, and the employee has marred it with this union button. Although the board didn't agree with that, he said that was a bit hyperbolic. <laughs> Nonetheless, uh, the employer did have the property right to brand the worker. So to set the stage for what Diane will be telling you about next, what we do in this paper, or try to do, I think, is use the Harris story, both Darlene Jesperson's side of it and the Harris side of it to try to tell the story as a branding, as an exercise in branding, and to explain why Harris fought so hard and why, perhaps, Darlene pressed this case. And our ultimate conclusion, uh, I don't know that we have a, a conclusion, but our ultimate sort of argument here is that we can't give up on any of the legal tools. This isn't just an argument that unions and collective bargaining are the way out of this morass. It's an argument that we need Title VII, we need the labor law, we need community activism, we need unions working together in sync to fight this kind of branding if employees want to resist it. Not all will, but some might. Diane? Okay. Um, I, I'm going to talk about how, uh, initially, about how Harris created and enforced its brand. And we sort of came at this from raising a couple of questions about why did Harris fight so hard? Um, why didn't they just buy out Darlene Jesperson if she would have been willing to pay? And the answer to that question actually comes out of Harris' brief, which says, uh, if one employee failed to comply, if one employee failed to comply, the brand standard failed. So this is what they were fighting for. On the other side, about Darlene, why did she resist so much? Why did she resist in, in spite of receiving an offer uh, to get her job back? And our understanding of this is that she really saw this as a problem in what was going on in the workplace as a result of the effects of branding, both on her but also on her coworkers. And we had independently found some evidence from news sources that there were other co-workers co uh, at the Harris Reno Casino and elsewhere that were objecting to this, but they were afraid, they were off the record, and they would not, uh, in meetings with corporate people, they would say, oh, we love it, we love these makeovers, this is really great, I look beautiful now, this sort of thing. Okay. Um, so where did Harris brand come from? And there's a narrative here um, that spans uh, quite a bit of time, but the part that deals with the 20 years of, of Darling Jesperson's time really is kind of an arc that goes from, uh, to per, from, uh, from Bill Hara, the founder, uh, to the current CEO, Gary Loveman. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how we got from Bill Hara to Gary Loveman and what that meant. Um, the other thing is that that it's a narrative about changes in corporate structure, uh, corporate uh, forms, um, corporate management. 
Um, and just to give you an understanding, from 1979 when she started as a bartender, Harris had two casinos in Nevada. Uh, when she left, was fired essentially in, in 2000, Harris had 26 casinos in 13 states and one foreign country. In 2005, actually before the litigation was over, Harris was, at that point, became the largest gaming corporation in the world. And if you follow the uh, Wall Street Journal and whatever, you may be aware that there was just a tender offer for, for $15 billion. So that's what the brand, the Harris brand, is worth today. Now, I'm going to go back and talk a little bit about Bill Hara because he's where it all starts. Uh, he founded Harris in uh, 1937 in Reno in a little bingo parlor. And about 10 years later, he opened a real true casino. And uh, what's interesting about the way he began his um, operation is he, from the beginning, set up his casino gaming in opposition to what was going on in Las Vegas. And we all know the story of Bugsy Siegel and the, the Jewish and Italian mobsters and the crime and the shootings and the whatever and the bodies in, out in the desert, whatnot. He set up his Harris brand for respectable, honest gaming as opposed to this kind of sleazy, you know, back room, criminals kind of uh, thing. And the Harris brand was built very much on, on the sort of thing he wanted men, uh, men to be able to bring his wives to his casino. And uh, so to do, to do this, among other things, he had bright lights inside, it wasn't dark, and he hired wholesome, young, clean-faced, you know, bright, honest, trustworthy-looking uh, people to work in his casinos. Uh, it was very important. So they were filling his brand. Now, the next thing he did that was kind of interesting is in the 1950s, he also actually was, began to feminize his casinos. And um, there was an interesting thing that, that um, uh, he looked at another little local club and saw that there were some women working there and he realized that a lot more people were coming into the casino and he figured out that it was because when people looked in and saw women working in the casinos, they figured out that it was a safe place to go. And so women were hired to, to sort of help this squeaky clean honest, respectable place uh, to go and visit and, and, and game and gamble. Um, so 1978, Bill Hara dies. And uh, shortly after he died, um, uh, there were some financial problems, whatever. His, his uh, uh, interests in the casino uh, were bought out by Holiday Inns, then the largest uh, lodging corporation in the world. It's at that same time that Darlene Jesperson comes to work at Harris. Now, his entire um, uh, set of rules about dress and grooming, which were very strict and very uh, uh, rigidly applied, um, were beginning to break down because we have this big corporate takeover, lots of bureaucratic rules, but as with bureaucracies, there were, there were exceptions made. And so Darlene got to get, get away with not following the makeup rule for many, many years. Um, then uh, um, goes through a period of vast corporate expansion. And actually, Paul mentioned this in the late 90s. Uh, they were facing a lot of trouble, the themed casinos, the, the expansion of Indian gaming, the Indian Gaming Act. Um, Gary Loveman, and I have to wrap this up very quickly, <laughs> Gary Loveman, uh, uh, MIT PhD in economics, Harvard Business School, marketing professor, was brought in and he said, this is like the, a giant laboratory for my theories. And he brought in his, uh, a lot of theories including cross-marketing, uh, which had been applied somewhat before that, but he brought everything to a new level, applying cross-marketing meant making sure that if you walked into any casino with the Harris name on it, you would instantly recognize the same kind of ex gaming experience. Um, technology, uh, just to give you an idea, 2003, um, 
Harris had data on 26, 26 million customers about their gaming practices, their gaming, their tastes, their, et cetera. Uh, surveillance and monitoring of employees. Um, expansive, of course, we all know casinos have a lot of cameras anyway, but the monitoring part of it comes out in this personal best policy, and I'm out of time. So I, let me wrap this up with this one little comment about two th the year 2000 and the personal best policy. This was uh, Bill, um, Gary Loveman's, uh, came out of this whole concept of building the brand and enforcing it through um, improving this gaming experience. And I want to give one little quote because it actually um, comes back to something that was said earlier. Um, this is something Gary Loveman said. Um, we focus on just one thing, a great gaming experience. We are not primarily families or for destination getaways. We are a gambling joint. And everything is designed to get people to the gaming tables and to keep them there. And uh, the design of the appearance code that Darlene was resisting had to do with um, an attempt to satisfy customer demands about what they experienced in, the, in that. And uh, again, I want to just come back to what, what Marion was saying. Uh, we're hoping to show in our paper the way in which sexual stereotypes fit into this, the creation of the branding, and how it began to be enforced, and also what are the possibilities for using Title VII still uh, to break through this uh, as Title VII once did uh, provide a way for women to become bartenders for the first time. And second, what, is, what role can unions play uh, through class action lawsuits, et cetera? And I've gone over my time. So. Um, the, the challenges posed by speaking at 10 5 on Friday <laughs> <coughs> before the cocktails flow um, last, uh, I assume are fairly obvious. Um, the, uh, the opportunities um, might not be quite so obvious, so let me tell you what I, I think they are, and then I'll speed this along. Um, you know, I've had the opportunity to listen to what all of you have said all day, and, and, and I, had a, um, I had a little talk planned that was based uh, on, on my paper, but because you've all said so many interesting things, I've, I've, um, I've changed it a little bit. So that, that, you know, to, to reflect, I hope, some of the themes that have, that have been uh, raised uh, throughout the day. The second, of course, is, you know, and I knew Kate Bartlett was a great scholar. I didn't know what kind of a dean she was, and I've been, I've been deaned before, but I've never been deaned like I was this morning when I asked a question that she decided was out of bounds. <laughs> And she responded by saying, don't worry, Michael, uh, at your session at the end of the day, which will be the most important session, you'll have the opportunity to share these ideas with the group. So welcome to the most important session uh, of, of the day. Um, and finally, uh, um, Catherine mentioned that, um, well, not finally, almost finally, uh, Catherine mentioned that uh, I'm, uh, I'm an associate dean at the moment. Um, so for me, this has been a spectacular experience, as you can probably imagine. I don't particularly want it to end. The encounter group, <laughs> the, the encounter group aspect of this has also been um, terrific. Um, and, and in the spirit of, you know, Anne McGinley admitting that she goes to casinos on a regular basis, and Gowrie admitting that she's been to Harrah's, and... Um, and we know, know, now know there are some tattoos in the audience. Um, I have had a, a facial. Um, and I have to say, I will have another because they are spectacular. Um, and the one thing about, that, about the Jesperson case that always struck me as, as easy was, you know, um, if makeup makes women look better, presumably it would make men look better. And in my, I look much better after my facial, I have to say, than I did before. So um, 
un unlike some of my predecessors, I, I, so I do want to thank all of you, actually, uh, for you know, at least have the, this opportunity to thank all of you for being here and for, or for sharing. Unless you have a, had a better um, deal than I did, um, you are here not because of the money, um, but because <laughs> you're interested in these issues and, and have been very, very generous in, in sharing, and, and I consider myself uh, one of the many beneficiaries uh, of your generosity. So I, I just want to make four points. Um, uh, one, perhaps uh, somewhat more pro provocatively than I, I might have otherwise, the first, and, and, that, and that's the first, and that is that I think of the existing bodies of law that have been discussed today, labor law, uh, and by labor law I mean uh, the law under the National Labor Relations Act and the enforcement of collective bargaining agreements, offers employees the most protection from employer discretion to impose uh, offensive or oppressive or what we would view as inappropriate um, appearance codes. Now, they, they do it in a particular way um, by focusing uh, on autonomy and privacy and not so much on discrimination. That's something that I want to uh, talk about uh, in a moment. I'm a, I'm a big fan of Title VII. Um, I love Title VII. I'd like to see Title VII um, be more vigorous than it is, but um, uh, but but, I, but 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 the National Labor Relations Act and, and collective bargaining do have a real role to play um, here, and um, this autonomy and privacy issue I think is important. I mean, you 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 may not agree that the workplace is a place where one should primarily find him or herself, sort of the point that that Mike Salmi was making this morning, but you know uh, Daryl Roberts made a point that it. I think that you know it shouldn't be a place. I think we can all agree where you should lose yourself, uh, and and that's really I, I think in, in, an important uh, point to keep um, uh, to keep in mind. And I, and I think collective bargaining uh, has the the capacity to do that. The second point is how much protection um, uh, collective bargaining agreement enforcement and the and the NLRA offers is it that's a very that's a very tricky question. It's trickier uh, than it is to sort of determine what Title VII law is. There there are cases you can read them. Uh, courts of appeals decisions, as a general matter, have some precedential value. Um, decisions made. Um, by private arbitrators interpreting uh, private collective bargaining agreements that are unreported uh, are, are much ha harder to sort of count up. It, it, it's much harder on the ground to know what's really happening. And so if you take a look at uh, our papers, you can see that we both have examples of arbitrators uh, taking very seriously uh, employers' promises to, uh, to impose only reasonable um, uh, regulation uh, in the workplace, um, but it you know it's very hard to say that that represents uh, you know w what part of the universe those cases uh, represent. But but it is fair to say uh, that we have we both have in our papers examples of real protection, the kind of getting to BFOQ quickly uh, that doesn't happen in the Title VII workplace. This sort of shift in understanding. Uh, of what the default rule is. Um, the default rule in the Title VII context is the at-will rule. The default rule um, is not necessarily uh, the at-will rule in the, in the unionized workplace. Third point um, is that I think this, I think we should be ambivalent and concerned about thinking about labor law in this context, but not dismissive. I mean, that, that, that I guess, is really my, my basic point. We should be ambivalent and concerned because um, there's low union density. You know, th th this is, this is a, uh, a body of law that is available in theory, but we know in fact uh, is unavailable uh, to many, uh, many, 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 many employees. Uh, and perhaps uh, more uh, importantly, and, 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 and Marion Crane has done you know, really terrific and important work in this area, and I'm delighted to uh, have the opportunity to be here with her today, um, the, the majoritarian problem of unions, right? That uh, these are majoritarian institutions, uh, and union leaders pay attention to, as a general matter, um, uh, the desires of a majority of the employees in the bargaining unit. So. Uh, in, a, in a bargaining unit that's predominantly white, black employees are going to have problems having their, uh, their interests um, um, asserted. Um, male, female, 
straight gay, right? This is the sort of easy to predict. What, what's a little more complicated, and this is a theme that I think has come up today, and I just wanted to take this opportunity to make the point. It happens in, fem in, in uh, uh, bargaining units that are predominantly female, right? There are, and this is one of the things that's so tricky about this area, right? Women don't necessarily agree on the impact of some of these appearance codes. Um, some women like makeup a lot. Uh, some women don't. Uh, in the um, so 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 there's a problem uh, sometimes even in the um, um, even in workplaces, unionized workplaces where women predominate. Finally, um, and this goes to the sort of inevitability point um, that I think um, um, Martha brought up. Um, Shockingly, uh, writing these papers from um, com completely different two minutes, good, um, uh, vantage points, um, both papers end with a discussion of flight attendants. And, I, and for me, the flight attendant story is uh, sort of a good news, optimistic story. This could be my this could be my Selexa talking, but I have become more optimistic about, about the inevitability question because it wasn't that long ago that flight attendants were all female, they were razor thin, they couldn't get married, they couldn't get pregnant, and they had to be under the age of 30, and in the beginning, they had to be nurses. Um, and that's all changed, right? That's changed a lot in a very short, relatively short period of time. And, and, and this is to, um, I, you know, I, I ultimately ag agree with Marion's last point, um, and I'm, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it again. Um, it's not because of one of these tools it's because of a combination of law, Title VII law, uh, union organizing and collective bargaining, customer preference, 9-11, um, right? The, the, the actual job has been completely reconceived and I'm not betting that in my lifetime you're going to go into a casino and the cocktail servers aren't going to be dressed in a way that resembles the way they're dressed today. Um, but this can happen in, in ways that we probably can't imagine now, uh, that I think were probably hard to imagine uh, in the days of the love airline. So that, that's all I have. All right, little discussion. Mike. Um, I want to just make a couple quick points, partly because I haven't said anything in a while and I, I feel like saying something. <laughs> uh, and they're going to be sort of related. Uh, one is on Catherine's point in terms of the customer preference and the, uh, the meat at Whole Foods. By the way, Whole Foods is a big corporation now that does sell meat and it sells very expensive meat <clears throat> for wealthy people like us. Just because we've been using Whole Foods, I think we were actually originally talking about some different, you know, a different kind of company, and it's not customer preference at that issue there, just like in Abercrombie and Fitch. It's the employer's prerogative to make money in a way. I mean, it's not that those customers actually do have <clears throat> the prerogative to leave, go elsewhere. And w if we're going to um, bind employers in that uh, by acceding to this dress, it will create a problem that is um, unsolvable, essentially, and I think we have to have some limits in that. Um, the second point. Uh, that, you know, when Michael was talking about the, the makeup and how women don't agree, you know, I keep thinking about reversing the situations. And, you know, if an employer banned makeup, I wonder first if we would care. And second, you know, clearly what Michael said, more women would be upset by banning makeup than by requiring it, most likely. If you look around here, I think more women are probably wearing makeup than not in that. And that would actually probably be a greater problem, but I think it's one that we wouldn't care very much about. And I'm not so sure exactly how that plays out. And then third, Michael made a very nice point. We all have in our papers the flight attendants because the, 
the, the case law about the flight attendants was very interesting, and there, there was a significant change has been made, except for one area. They're still paid terribly poorly. Uh, and they are now, one, you know, one of the advantages is uh, men, women, gays, uh, old people, young people can all be exploited in these jobs. <laughs> <laughs> and so we didn't actually, you know, we did make some changes, but we, we, you know, one part was ultimately still left out, and they're unionized too. And I think that's also, you know, most of them are unionized, a symbol of, you know, the, um, the vast problems that go well beyond Title VII. Well, that was a conversation stop. <laughs> <laughs> I have that. <laughs> Maybe, maybe for well, the Michael speak, I, I have the urge to respond. But <laughs> <laughs> also, I tend because to promote that. Because comments are always so, so uh, interesting <coughs> and, 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 and uh, prompting, prompting something uh, in written response. Uh, I, I'm not sure if I would say that the fire attendants, if you look at their salary, maybe it has not changed you know, when you control for inflation. But if they, were, if they worry about these other things, like not having uh, this restriction in terms of weight and appearance and the like, who is supposed to say that they are not better off? No, I mean their their pay might not have changed, but their whole salary package, you know, including all these other workers' conditions, might have changed. And that is, I think that's that's the idea that uh, Diane and Miriam's papers are about, which is there are these other things that employers. <coughs> And that employees can bargain about, but we are not bargaining about because we assume that employees have no right over them. So maybe pay is part of that, but there are these other identity factors that they could bargain about, and maybe the flight attendants made that trade off. You know, we want to have these, you know, as a class, again, I'm talking very general terms, so forgive the generalization, Barbara. Uh, but they, as a class, they are better off because they have improved in other areas, perhaps not in pay, but in other areas that, that they didn't have to can I respond to that? That's something, actually, Mike and I were talking about this at lunch. I sort of attacked him and grabbed him and said, this is, I think this is what he and I have disagreed about this for years and years. Um, and that is something he said this morning suggested that we really ought to, work time is for work, and work should be about, wa unions and workers should be concerned about wages and benefits, the economics of work. And what the flight attendance cases really show is that so, for some groups of workers, there are some issues that are prior almost. It's not that they don't want more wages and better benefits, but if you can't keep your job beyond age 32, uh, or you can't get married, uh, or you can't get pregnant, et cetera, et cetera, you don't have a job, so why worry about the wages and benefits? It just doesn't go on anywhere. There's no future to it. You're not a worker, really, even. Um, so it, it seems to me that one of the things that we are pressing for in this paper is, is trying to press unions and, and saying, look, there are examples of unions that have gone beyond economics. That's not to say we shouldn't focus on economics, but there's no reason we can't move beyond that in organizing and bargaining as well as using litigation <coughs> strategies to go after that, including Title VII, but not limited to it. Barbara? I, I don't disagree with you at all. I think that and I, I'm thinking about the dignitary benefits of whiteness right now, and, and I think it's hugely <coughs> important. But at the same time, your comments just reminded me of Fran Ansley saying years ago, what is it we're fighting for here, equal stratification? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> there's, we have to keep our eye on all this stuff at the same time. Yeah. All the way in the back. Yeah, um, I'm Mason Alexander. I'm a management labor lawyer from Charlotte. I do traditional labor work, bargain contracts, things like that. I I'll tell you, here's what happens in bargaining. You've got a bargaining committee that's trying to come back with a contract the membership will agree to. And their priorities are basically set by whatever the membership's hot buttons are. And, you know, I, I have, have listened today to this, this discussion, and one thing I've been struck by is sort of how far removed from <laughs> the average blue-collar worker uh, uh, your thought processes are. I, they don't, <laughs> in, at least in my experience, have these same kind of concerns. They have other concerns, and that's what the unions bargained for. 
and it's usually wages and benefits and sometimes you know the, the retirement plan is a big hot button issue and sometimes overtime is I mean it, it'll vary from year to year and from from workplace to workplace but that that union bargaining committee can go in and get a deal that they can sell the membership and if they load it up give up a bunch of stuff to kind of get branding restrictions or whatever it may be that don't matter that much to the membership they get back and the membership say well where's the money here you know where Where's the pension increase I wanted? So, I, I mean, I, I think that's part of what's going on in collective bargaining. I mean, the, 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 the masses, I mean, the top of the labor movement may be, is, is far more progressive than the rank and file. The masses just aren't there. <coughs> Can I just make one comment? Um, I have to say, and, and I didn't do nearly as much work, obviously, as uh, Marion and, and Diane have done on this, but, um, <laughs> I'm not sure anybody ever has. Um, but I did not find much evidence that unions do bargain hard over these issues in negotiations. Uh, um, but, and, and this is a real thing, um, all, the, all the agreements that you're signing do have just cause provisions, right? And I, and I, ha I have examples of employees, one in particular, uh, who was discharged because her employer said, you know, we have a no piercings rule. Do you have your tongue stud in today? And she said, no. And the employer said, stick out your tongue. And she said, no. And the employer fired her. And the arbitrator reinstated her. That's real stuff. That, you know, that's real that's real protection for real people on, on the ground, I think. Well, here, let me just make one point about that. <clears throat> Labor arbitrations cost the union money. They cost the local money. And while the internationals have lots and lots of money, the locals usually don't. And so it takes a commitment. Mo the vast majority of discharges are never arbitrated. They take them through the grievance procedure, and that's the end of it. Rarely do you see more than one or two uh, arbitrations over the life of a contract for a discharge. You'll get arbitrations on contract interpretation, particularly where money may be involved. But discharge, unless you fire a union steward, then you will always get an arbitration. <laughs> um, and, and so that is a case in which the local membership was basically willing to back that employee. That is an unusual, at least in my experience, that's an unusual um, kind of case for them to spend that much of their money uh, on, on a single discharge if there's not some to them. And obviously, in this case, there was bigger issue in play. Can I just bring this back to Harris? Because you have had your hand up, and I hope that we're going to let you speak. But one of the things that we found, just, and maybe you'll respond to these comments, one of the things that we found evidence about in, the, in this case, in the Jesperson case, what we asked, I was always asking, where are the unions? Why didn't the unions do anything? We did a lot of research. My RA, who's up there, did a lot of this. And we found um, quite a bit of evidence to the effect that the Culinary Workers Union had long ago entered into an arrangement with Harrah's and other large casinos in Vegas to the effect that they would support, the union would support the casino's agendas and work as partners with the casino to expand the brand nationally and perhaps globally, I don't know. So we had, we had stories about workers who flew, were flown to Providence, Rhode Island to testify before the General Assembly on Harrah's behalf about how great it was to work for Harrah's so, so that uh, Harris could expand its brand and, and you know, grow in that area. So the employer and the union were aligned here on the interest of expanding the brand. And indeed, there were uh, clauses in the master bargaining agreement, which I have a copy of, which uh, are neutrality and card check clauses in which what Harris gave in return was Union, we'll, we, we want you, as, as you were saying, we want you as a partner in all of our operations. We're not anti-union. So what the union did from a position of weakness is trade uh, industry, you know, sector-wide representation rights for some perhaps stronger contract rights. Can you I respond? Like I think you're both right in part in the discussion about the importance and and uh, effectiveness of the union. Um, yes, there's a partnership. And yes, we have car check agreements um, with several unions, including the Culinary Workers Union. There is, there is a, 
and interdependence, they support us to expand our operations. Not, not so much because they love us, but we're often competing with very non-anti-union companies for limited licenses in Europe, in Rhode Island, in Massachusetts, elsewhere. And they would intend, the union will intend to support us knowing we, our views on, on unionization versus our competitors, some of our competitors' views on unionization. In that respect, there's an agreement. There's no agreement to, there is no partnership or agreement to stay on the sidelines in an issue like this, like the Jesperson case. Not at all. I don't know why, and perhaps others, the litigants do, um, people actually litigated the case do. I don't know why the unions weren't involved more or less in that case, except, and this leads to the other point, uh, if we banned makeup, I can assure you within 24, I, I negotiate all the collective bargaining agreements, many of the collective bargaining agreements for Harris, and I arbitrate all the cases for Harris. And we have many, many, and it keeps me too busy, many termination cases we arbitrate. Um, if we banned makeup, within 24 hours, I would get a very grievance challenging that by the challenging that banning of makeup by the union as unreasonable because there would be hundreds of cocktail servers at the union doorstep saying, by banning makeup, you're impacting my ability to earn tips. Mm -hmm. So is this discussion removed? It's fascinating. I'm so glad to be here. Is it removed <laughs> from what most people are concerned about who are impacted by these rules? Yes. And that's where, and you talked about the majority <laughs> issue, um, that's where the limit is in the effectiveness of unions. In, in my negotiations with the culinary union, on only one occasion did they ever bring up an, an appearance or grooming or uniform issue, and that was that they wanted um, our, the housekeepers, guest room attendants who clean the rooms, w w wear uniforms, which is, includes a skirt. They asked that, house, that they have the option to wear pants, easier to clean the rooms, and we agreed to that. That's the only time I can ever remember that, that, that they're raising that issue because the great majority of the membership is more interested in wages and benefits and pension. And not only are, do they not want to um, expend their political capital, and I don't think they're weak, certainly not in Las Vegas. It's very heavily unionized and they can shut down the town with a strike and they're very powerful. Um, they don't want to expend the political capital, even if they have a lot of it, on those issues because very few of their members are interested in those issues. They've also lost board, the board, the early board case, the 1960s case about Harris was the first of those union insignia cases that said Harris has a right to have a uniform requirement and even a union button doesn't, doesn't you know, even a Section 7 protection under the NLRA won't trump the property right of Harris in that uniform. So it's pretty well established as a matter of law. Well, well it, it, it depends on the particular circumstances. We permit union buttons just about everywhere. That there may be very few exceptions, and we reach an accommodation with the union, a very, very high-end restaurant, um, celebrity chef restaurant, where our celebrity chef says, you're going to look exactly like you look at my three-star Michelin restaurant in Paris, and they don't wear big yellow buttons say, un that say union yes, <laughs> and they're not going to wear it in my restaurant in their seat. And, so we, and we go to the union, and we explain that, and we get an accommodation there. But generally, um, and I know there was a recent case, generally, um, we do permit employees to wear their union buttons at work. It's interesting, this whole question of how workers weigh identity issues against money issues and whether sort of academia is out of touch by not caring enough about the bread and butter issues is an issue that happens all over the law and has been happening for a really long time. Back when people used to read Marx, lo those many years ago, remember it was, it was called, well, if workers, you know, think that they're better off, if all those women that Anne writes about think they're they're better off with boob jobs and push-up bras because they can make more money, is, do we honor that because they say, look, I can make more money, or do we say, no, that's false consciousness, right? And so this whole question of how you know how we should talk about what is in the best interest of workers when they are saying, gee, sure, I'll take off all my clothes if I can make more money, is that something that we should say, all right, cool, let's do it? Or are we saying, no, in fact, there are other values here that that ought to be prioritized and we need to reshape the world so that you get it. Um, but that will be conversation for another day. Let's declare an end to this panel so that we can hear from Devin. Thank you.
I think. So I'll, I'll try and get through this as uh, quickly as I can. I want to start by thanking, again, Catherine and me 